Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to see you all today and to welcome you to another wonderful Explorer classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. So our Explorer Classroom events digitally connect students from all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers, who are amazing scientists, filmmakers, adventurers, researchers, photographers, you name it. Um, and once we're all together in the Explorer Classroom, we have a short lesson and an extended Q&A. Today, we're very lucky to have Sara Baluch joining us. Sara is an ecologist at Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. Her research examines the consequences of the decline of plant species on reptiles in the agricultural landscape of New South Wales, Australia. And she's joining us today to teach us a little bit about lizard ecology. We're going to hear about some Australian lizards and we're going to hear about a recent project with tree dragons in Pakistan in just a minute. But before we get started with that, I do want to acknowledge that it's not just me and Sara today. We're also joined by students from all around the world. We have a few of them up on screen with us and we have many, many more watching along on YouTube. Hi folks. Today, our students represent Bangladesh, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Egypt, Jamaica, India, Pakistan, Paraguay, the, um, let's see, the United Kingdom, Ukraine, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Utah, and Virginia, and like probably some more places too. So if I happen to miss your state or your country, please let me know in the chat bar. I'd love to give you a shout out in a little bit. But for now, that is plenty from me. Let's turn it over to Sara for today's lesson on lizards. Thank you, Celeste. Um, super excited for this opportunity. Um, I was looking forward, I've been following these classrooms lately uh, throughout this quarantine period. And I really wanted to join you guys and talk about the lizards and some cool facts about the reptiles. Um, so anyone out there, is scared of um, lizards? Oh, I can see one hand. No, okay. So just, just one hand, I'll quickly share my screen. Cool. So not many kids, I can, I, I'm very impressed. I couldn't see a lot of hands raised when I asked that anyone out there is scared of lizards. Well, I was scared of lizards when I was a kid. Or you can say I had a phobia about lizards, which seems really strange that now I'm working on reptiles. And when I was a kid, I had a phobia about the lizards or reptiles in general. Um, so there was a small journey from phobic to lizards to now handling the lizards. I was uh, born and raised up in Pakistan. Now I'm based in Melbourne. I moved to Melbourne about four years ago for my PhD. Um, so before that, there's some cultural region reasons behind me being phobic to lizards. Um, and I was more scared of, which is like very strange, but these small house geckos, um, I used to find them really creepy and it's funny that they every single time they used to fall on me and I would just scream and run around the house and you know scream to my mother oh I got you know um, a lizard jumped on me and you know make a big fuss about it um, so I really wanted to get rid of my phobia uh, from lizards and the way I got got rid of it is by working on them so I started working, I did my master's on reptiles and I started working on snakes initially. And for the first time when I held um, a lizard in my hand, I started crying. I said, how am I gonna do that? Um, and it was more of the reason that how we used to, you know, hear about the myths in our society, in our culture, that, you know, everything is venomous. Everything about reptiles is venomous, which was not true. Um, so from the journey of, being scared and phobic to lizards, I started handling the lizards and I 
felt great when I held them for the first time. They are like any other animals. They feel, for me, I feel that they feel affection as well. So whenever I hold lizards now, I pat them and, and I've got a supervisor in my PhD who constantly tells me that you don't need to pet, pat them on the head like a cat or a dog, but I feel that even the lizards feel affection at the same time and really feel like every animal needs affection. Um, so it's been a wonderful journey for me to get rid of my fear from lizards, um, to start working on the lizards. And um, while I was looking for opportunities to work on the lizards, I found Australia, which is also Australian deserts are known as the land of lizards. So I found out like it's the great opportunity to move to Australia and to work on the reptiles. And they've got like enormous, beautiful species um, of reptiles out here. So the one I'm uh, holding right now is a faded dragon and I'm gonna share more facts about it in, um, in a bit. So, as you can see, I flew from Pakistan to Australia three years back to start working on reptiles. Before I did some small projects on reptiles and like snakes in general. Um, so my journey started in, in Melbourne to Deakin University and I started working in New South Wales. Um, so Australia has like the diverse fauna of reptiles. There are about a thousand species of reptiles in total and the 14% of world's reptiles actually um, living in Australia, and 93% of them are native to Australia. Um, so you see cool, big dragons and some small, beautiful, pretty skinks, some deadly venomous snakes to small worm snakes. Um, and when I came to Australia, and even if you Google up, you'll see like reptiles in Australia, and you'll see the um, snakes are coming out of like toilets and lizards are coming out of the ovens. That's how you see the lizards in Australia and reptiles in Australia. They're everywhere and they are not harmful. Um, they are defensive animals. They don't attack you unless they feel threatened. So when I got over here, I was like, um, you see such signs everywhere. The snake may be in the toilet bowl and it actually happens. It does happen. It's it's true. You you go to the countryside, you go to the areas near bushes, you see, see snakes and lizards everywhere. Um, so it was another um, surprise for me to work in a space where I would you know. Because in Pakistan, there's the population rate is really high and you um, really get to um, see the animals in the field. But here in Australia, they're everywhere. You don't have to struggle that hard to find them. Um, so this one is my favorite lizard. It's bearded dragon. And as you can see, anyone could guess where the name comes from. So it has like spiny scales around it, its neck, which appears like a beard. So the name bearded dragon comes from this beard around its neck. Um, and when it's stressed, it's probably, you know, uh, it just flats out and seems like it's, you know, screaming at you or something, but it's one of my favorite things. It's beautiful, it's very pretty. Um, so when I, you know, I looked at these lizards, I thought I should do something. I should, I really want to explore more about Australian uh, reptile fauna. So I looked around to what are the key factors and what are the key threats that are going on in the environment in Australia. Um, and I came across um, that, you know, there's some fragmentation, there's like forest cutting going on, the uh, fragmentation is um, going along and the reptiles are actually struggling in finding habitats in that for uh, their survival. So reptiles need specific structures to survive in because they're ectozoans and, you know, they have specific behavioral requirements to survive in the environment. Um, so I came across a um, some keystone structures in the environment, which are really important for the reptiles to survive in. So I went to a big farmland in New South Wales and um, Larger this is how it looks like. Um, so I'll share a quick clip about how uh, my study sites looked like. And um, I, you'll see me, and this is the beta dragon running. Actually, 
this was really cool so i take some um uh, traps and i'm going to share more details on how we uh, do this trapping so i'm taking out some stuff from my buckets these are the buckets that we use to catch the animals in um before i share the technique of how we catch the reptiles um this is just a small representation of how um the grass that i'm going to talk about so i uh worked in a massively fragmented farmland area and there were special grass structures which are called stenifex they are prickly grasses um i'll show you how it looks so this is how it looks it's like a prickly long grass and reptiles actually run and um hide in those grass structures so the reason they would run and hide in these structures is either the predators either a large bird is looking for them to hunt on either they need some food because these grasses are rich in termites and small insects that that the lizards eat um and sometimes you know the reptiles are ectotherms they can't maintain their body temperature so the temperature inside these grasses are really um good for them they can maintain their body temperatures inside these grasses but these grasses were declining in the areas where i was working so i wanted to look at how the reptiles are coping with this um change in the environment um and how would i look at it so i thought let's trap some animals and how would i do the trapping so you saw me taking out the stuff from a bucket so we usually take like one foot tall bucket we uh dig it into the ground with the level of the bucket on the um with the mouth of the bucket on the level of the ground and when the reptiles crawl they just fill into those buckets so sometimes you have fences around the buckets and the reptiles just crawl and they they can't figure out that there is some danger next to them and they just fall into those buckets and then you go in the morning and the evening you take out the lizards and then you see how many lizards you have caught in a day and then you do your further analysis to see how how the results come out so this is what i did in new south wales i installed my traps next to those spinifex grasses and i wanted to see how many lizards are surviving in those lands where these grasses um are less in number or more in number or are in good condition or in bad condition um because australia really needs to save these grasses to save the reptiles right um so there were some cool reptiles that i caught in my traps there was small um, skinks a couple of small skink species as you can see on the top eastern robust spider there were snake eyed skinks um common dwarf skink um i was scared of geckos when i was a kid but then i got this now my favorite if someone ask me what's my favorite lizard i say spiny tail gecko it's pretty cool um look at the patterns on its skin it's it's awesome um and then eastern bearded dragon so the big big lizards they jump out of the buckets because the buckets is just you know one foot tall so i caught the baby dragons in my traps but the big ones they just jumped out um and then i got a couple of snakes so they were like small worm snakes blind snakes um sand guana it looks big in the picture but i got the baby one and then the timid sliders so there were like really cool species that i got in my traps which was really awesome but i still have a um, one lizard on my wish list that i really want to see in australia which is this devil thorny devil isn't it cool it's really cool um this this thorny devil it's found in the deserts of australia and you know how the scale, scaly skin of reptiles work so they have this ability of not, they don't need a lot of water so the australian deserts are very they have like very harsh climatic conditions so they don't need a lot of water because they you know um their skin is capable of penetrating a lot of water storage and um this is a really cool lizard and i am looking forward to spot it one day hold it in my hand i don't know how because it's really funny but i'm going to do it i don't know how um another cool thing that i thought that i should share with you guys is that once we catch so i catch like once i trap install my traps 
and I catch like hundreds of lizards and then I release them back in the evening. But what if I catch the same lizards on the second day of trapping? Sometimes we do five days of trapping, sometimes we do 10 days of trapping. So how about like, if I catch on the second day, the same number of lizards, that would be a false data, right? So you know what I do? I mark them. And we've got like small injections with some fluorescent color in it, which is not harmful at all. And you don't have to inject all the way through it. It's just on the top of the skin. Um, so you put some, some, you give lizards some points um, and then you do batch marking. So if you've got like 50 lizards, you put some injection on the point one or on the point two, and then, you know, there's some color in it. So if on this, and then you use an ultraviolet lamp to see the color of the lizard. So once you mark them, release them back on the second day. If you catch the same lizard, you bring them back to the field station and you check with the ultraviolet lamp. Is it a new lizard or the old one? So I found it really cool technique to see if you catch the lizards again. Because, you know, for the scientists, they have to be really careful about their data. They don't have to, you know, um, uh, mess it up by catching the same lizard again and again. So we have to make sure whatever we get in the trap is captured only once. Um, if it's captured twice, we don't include it in our data. So this was a really cool um, um, technique that I was introduced, how to mark the reptiles. Of course, you don't do it for the venomous snakes, but you do it for the small snakes or the non-venomous snakes. Um, we usually don't handle venomous snakes. I'm not very good at handling venomous snakes, so I prefer um, to use my equipment to handle them and then just release them back. My research was all about just capturing them, counting them, and releasing them back. I didn't um, do any other procedures on them. So this was a very cool research that I did in um, Australia. And once I was introduced to a lot of um, techniques of research, I thought I should go back and do some research in my home country, um, which was like, I had the opportunity and I contacted uh, National Geographic and I thought, like, how about this project? We do it together. And they were like, yeah, that sounds so cool. Um, and I went back to Pakistan for six months and um, I did another research for my PhD. So I'm gonna share some details on how I did that. So I wanted to see how lizards move when there's so much fragmentation going on because there are farmlands everywhere. Where's their habitat? How, did, how do they survive in, um, in nature when there's like not enough food for them, not enough shelter for them? So that led me do a research on this pretty tree dragon. So this small, little fella i um it's quite abundant in pakistan and i picked up some sites in the rural areas of pakistan you see this small gray thing on its back this is a small transmitter so this transmitter is used to track the movements which was so cool so what you do is that you put on a transmitter on the lizard you have an antenna in your hand this transmitter has a frequency on it which matches with the engine on your hand and you have a receiver and you track the lizard. Um, once you put the tracker in it, you just get to see wherever it is. So the antenna beeps and you just follow wherever it's leading. Um, and it was really hard because this lizard camouflages. It changes its color. So once it was on the tree, I, it was so hard to use for me to look it on the top of the tree. Um, but yeah, I, I started working on this lizard to see how it's surviving in those fragmented lands because the agriculture and the farming going on in Pakistan is massive. It's really bad. And I wanted to see uh, if there's anything left for these lizards because they are really important for the environment. They are pest controllers. They are they have a lot of um, important roles. But you know, normally people are just like, oh, it's just a lizard. You know, it's not that important or it's just a snake. It's, it's venomous, it's harmful for the environment, but it's not. They have got um, a lot of ecological importance beyond what people think about them. So I went back and I started working with this lizard. Um, so this is how those um, sites that I worked in. So I 
picked up some sites within agriculture and then I went in the forest. On the boundary of the forest, there were a lot of lizards and then within the forest, there were a lot of lizards. Um, so I picked up some sites and I started finding those lizards to put the trackers on. Um, so I had a target of like catching 20, 25 lizards and then I would track them on daily basis to see where they, they go. It's the same lizard that I showed you before. And that's how when it changes its color, it looks like. So it changes its color to dark orange, red um, on the next side, sometimes on the head. And um, usually the male lizards, they do it uh, when they're looking for the female lizards during the breeding season, when they're looking for their mates, they do that. Um, and when the male, one male is telling the other male that this is my house, this is my territory, don't come to my house. Um, and you know, this is a sign of pushing the other lizard away. Um, so these lizards camouflage and it's pretty cool to see when they change their color. And it sometimes happened in front of me when I was approaching them uh, to take my marks on where they are. Um, so stress is another factor that whenever they feel danger, they start changing their coloration. So that was really cool. Um, and that's a very cool fact about them. Um, so when I went back, I was like, I'm gonna find some habitat for them. And this is what I came across. There were industries all over. There was farming going on. There were human settlements. I was like, where are the lizards living? There, there's no way they could survive in these kind of environments where they don't have enough food. And I really wanna look into, um, what sort of habitats they are stopping in and what sort of habitats they are um, living in. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of how we track them. So once I put the transmitter on, we just used to release them back and there they go. And the next step would be, I would have my antenna and receiver in my hand and I would go out three times in a day to see how far do they go? Um, so what at the spot where I release them, I would come after three hours or four hours to check if it's um, in the same area. Most of the times they usually don't, don't travel longer distances. So, so they would be like 10 meters away from the area of release or 20 meters. But there were some cool results where they traveled longer distances. So I'll share the next one with you. So um. Once we get the points in our, um, you know, once we spot them, we put the data in our phones and we transfer the data into computer and some softwares that we use. And these softwares give us a result of um, maps, which shows these points where we track them. So these points that you see on the screen are the ones where we track the lizards. So these are number of locations when the lizards were retracked. And that was, um, so I tracked them for like six months and that was the beginning of tracking. But you know what, by the end of the tracking, the lizards traveled all the way from croplands to the forest. And pretty obvious, they didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough shelter in the croplands, so they didn't want to go somewhere um, where they find enough shelter. Um, and I spotted like, it was so hard to spot them um, because they you know, have they changed their color. And usually um, the females were on the top of the trees. So the trees were really long and you had, you know, my neck would start hurting if I would look up and try to locate the lizard if it's actually on the top of the tree or not. So there were some um, lizards which I spotted on the top of the tree. There were some which were hidden on the fence of the croplands. Some were in the middle of the bushes, but how, how that antenna works is that, you know, it beeps louder when you are close to the lizard. Um, so that's how I used to spot them. But it was really cool um, and it was a fun activity and exhausting as well when I would stay at a place for 15 minutes and I couldn't spot them because they were camouflage. It was impossible to see them in through the bush bushes. Um, so this lizard, after that baby dragon, this lizard is really close to my heart. I worked with it for six months and it was such a wonderful experience for me um, to see how they survive. Um, and yeah, so I'm working on my results for my PhD, but I realized that um, 
these lizards, they usually stop over at the boundary of the, so this lizard is now at, um, in a hedge, you know, hedge around the croplands where farmers usually grow uh, extra grasses or flowers to, to mark the boundary of their cropland or the farm. And these lizards prefer to uh, stay in those hedges and the boundaries because they find enough food over there. Uh, there's a lot of insects and you know, they are um, uh, much more, much less exposed to their predators as well. So I wanted to do, I wanted to deliver this information to the local people as well, to tell them, you know, you should grow some hedges around your cropland boundaries because there are lizards over there. And at the same time to guide them that how lizards are important for their environment. So I wanted to see more lizards and more snakes. So I did an extra thing. I thought let's install some traps and I wanna check if there are other uh, species. And so I just quickly designed another project and I said, let's see um, if there are more animals in the farmlands before they cut the farm, uh, cut the crops or after uh, the crops are cut, how many animals are there. So we did some trapping and I'm gonna show you. So I had some really good volunteers who helped me out. We had like not uh, very much good uh, equipment to work with. So these fence that you can see in the video when the lizards and the snakes crawl along these um, fences, um, that's how they, fall into because when, once they're running along the fence they just quickly fall into the bucket and after a few hours we just take them up um so we did some trapping when the crops were standing and we did some trapping after the crops were cut down to see were there any animals uh, greater in number before the cutting happened or after the harvest. And we got some really cool species of lizards over there as well. So the um, spotted barn gecko is the one that I was always scared of. And look, I'm holding that, <laughs> which was such a good achievement for me that oh, finally I'm over my phobia. Um, and then we had this Bengal monitor lizard. It's a baby one um, because the bigger one just jump out. Um, you see the blocks in my traps. These blocks are, because it gets really warm, reptiles come out in warm weather, and it's really, it, inside the trap, it gets really warm for them. So we put some pipes and blocks as a shelter for them, and otherwise they will just die with dryness in, uh, you know, warm temperature. So we had strip grass, pink, and the, uh, on the right top, this fat tail gecko. It's a very important lizard. Um, unfortunately, it's uh, declining in Pakistan because illegal trade is happening. A lot of people are catching it and selling it for a few bucks. Um, when I um, started my surveys in those areas, there were people who came up and told me, um, you know, this lizard has already been uh, extinct from the area, but it wasn't. I found it and I couldn't report it because, you know, there would people come up and you know, start catching them and selling them. So this is what I'm looking forward to work on the future, work in the future to save them and, you know, um, do something about the illegal trade that is happening. Um, part of my research involved interacting with kids like you. Um, there's massive lack of awareness in these countries, in the third world and underdeveloped countries where people are not aware of the ecological importance of the reptiles. Um, so I wanted to go up and talk to the kids over there and tell them that, you know, this is something you're not aware of, but it's never too late. And you, you know, this is what we could do about it. Spread the awareness, uh, go and talk to the people, why reptiles are important for our environment. So I started some, you know, small workshops in the schools and on the top picture, there were, um, some farmers kids who were my little volunteers. They used to spot lizards for me. When I was drained and I was uh, giving up on, I can't find the lizards. They would just come up and they would tell me, Sara, we found a lizard for you. And I would just go and catch the lizard from there. So I had um, amazing experience working with these kids because they were passionate like any other 
um, herpetologist and um, I, I saw a ray of hope that how um, the future um, is in safe hands because they realize that, yeah, it is important for environment and it is something that we need to talk about. We need to tell people uh, why reptiles are important for our environment and why we need to save them. And um, yeah. So yeah, this is me holding my little pillow. Um, and I think we all know that um, it's a great saying that the greatness of a nation can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And I hope to see in future that my country, um, Australia, I feel is already doing really well um, when I um, approach the younger generation over here. They're pretty much aware of my reptile and they really look after their reptiles. But for the you know, developing countries, it's a bit harder and we need to more work more on spreading information over there. Um, that was the aim of my project. And I'm glad that I uh, collaborated with National Geographic um so there you go. yeah they need to be loved too <laughs> like all of us um we it's there's nothing to be shy about if you're scared of lizards and you know we find them creepy and all that i shared my story that i was phobic to them um but they are like any other animals um they need to be saved they need to they need our love and affection and you know attention on top of it so i hope you enjoyed it sorry that was awesome so many amazing lizards so many cool ways of, of tracking and trapping and releasing them the chat bar is lighting up so for all of you folks out there watching on youtube keep sending those questions it's in we record everything that you send so you only need to send your question one time but we'll get through as many as we possibly can and our first question today is going to come to us from an on-screen student let's visit anulia for our first lizard question uh so my question is do does global warming affect lizards in australia and does it affect um lizards in pakistan Sorry, I couldn't get the first part. Does global warming impact the lizards in Australia or Pakistan? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, so in Australia, there's been a lot of research going on to see the impact of global warming. There are lab experiments going on. There are field experiments going on to see how it actually impacts the lizards and in reptiles in general. Um, it's different in Pakistan. We know we are aware that there's a lot of uh, you know massive destruction going on and how global uh, warming is impacting the fauna over there. But what we are lacking in Pakistan is the baseline data. You know we don't even have uh, the exact species number. We don't. We are not even aware of how many have gone extinct. And you know what? Probably there have been a number of species that have already been extinct, gone extinct but we are unaware of them. Um, unnoticeably, they have gone extinct. So what we are trying to do in Pakistan is that we are not at a stage of do, doing any advanced research like Australia is doing, because Australia um, has got the baseline data. Now they are on the second stage. Now they are doing, doing some advanced research. But for Pakistan, um, we are not um, at a stage where we are aware of what's going wrong at the moment. Um, and that's why I went back and, you know, my study was one of, was first of its kind where we installed like 400 traps and we tracked a lizard and it was something that happened for the first time because there are a lot of factors, um, lack of funding and stuff, but we are aware that global warming is actually affecting a lot of, um, species over there. But in Australia, yes, uh, there's a lot of research going on. We do lab experiments. Um, on looking at their um, respond to different uh, temperatures. And sometimes when we work in the field, my research was kind of a part of it because you know how fragmentation um, is just cutting down the forest and just cutting down the forest is you know, reducing the keystone structures that are required by lizards. Um, so yeah, on a massive scale, it, reptiles are being affected by it. 
Well, the chat bar is now just full of people screaming, save the lizards. So uh, I, I hope that you'll have more help shortly. Um, and we had so many questions earlier, Sarah, when you were showing us how you tag and track lizards day over day when you're sampling, folks were wondering if the lizard was actually purple or if that was a UV light. Can, can you clear that up for us? The color? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the lizard looked kind of purple when you put six different dots on it. Okay, um, so the fluorescent color could be, um, you know, I used the yellow color, but it looked purple because I was holding an ultraviolet lamp over it. Um, so it's hard. Um, so you can see the color clearly when it's like a baby lizard or a skin or small lizard. But when they're, um, you know, big lizards, big in size, uh, it's very hard to see through the uh, fluorescent color in it. So sometimes if the color gets older, if you mark on day one, by six or seven day, it's harder to spot that color. So in that case, we use the lamp. And with the lamp, you can easily see the fluorescent color on it. So it wasn't purple. It was just a um, lamp color over it. So cool. Thank you for clarifying that. And as a quick follow-up, because I know they're going to ask, are there purple lizards? Purple lizards. Oh, I haven't come across any purple lizard yet, but um, the way they change the colors, sometimes I call it orange, red, or, you know, um, chameleons might maybe come purple at some point, but <laughs> I haven't come across any. <laughs> Love it. We got to keep looking then. It, it looked very, very neat when it was glowing purple. Let's go to Arjun for our next question. Go for it, Arjun. Um, have you discovered any new species of lizards? Have I discovered? Okay. Yeah. So I didn't discover any new species yet. Arjun, that would be a massive achievement in my career if I ever uh, <laughs> uh, discover a new species. But what was, and I see a potential of doing that in Pakistan. So fingers crossed. Uh, because there's not massive uh, surveys or research going on over there. But when I started working and uh, um, that was not part of my research, but I came across a burrowing frog. Um, if you Google it up, you'll see it's a, it's a uh, bulky frog. Um, and it wasn't reported from my area of research. Like it was never reported from that region uh, in that rural area where I was working. So I found it and I asked my supervisor, we identified it and they would, uh, now we are writing a paper over it that it is reported for the first time over there, but it's not a new species. It, it's a species that is found in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, everywhere, um, but it was found in that region for the first time. Uh, but yes, I would love to find a new species. Um, but uh, there's another fun fact. There's a lizard in Pakistan, which, um, I share my name with her. Sorry. So in our language, we um, a lizard is a feminine. <laughs> but, uh, so its um, scientific name is Sarah Hardwicky. So I started tracking on that lizard at first, but the trackers could not glued on it. So we dropped that project. But that is another fun fact that I share my name with the lizard. So cool. So appropriate. And we've got <laughs> Austin uh, Corcoran Scott in the chat bar who's wondering if lizards can detach their tails. Yeah, so this is um, um, found in geckos and it's a defensive me mechanism against the predators. So they drop their liz uh, tails and that happened to me, to an experienced person like me a lot of times. So when I used to get a gecko in my trap, um, I would see that, oh, I got the lizard now. And when I would take my hand out, it was the tail. It wasn't the lizard. And they would just, eventually I would get the lizard. Uh, but, you know, this is a defensive mechanism where they drop their tails and they regenerate them later on, um, which is really cool. Um, but the big lizards, the dragons, they can't do it. So uh, I've seen this uh, in small skins. So the pictures that I showed you from Australia, Almost all of those skinks could do it. Cool. Well, let's take our next question from Brianna. Go for it, Brianna. What do you love most about your job? 
What do I love most about my job? Yeah. Oh, a lot of things. A lot of things. Um, but where do I start from? Um, nature is what I love most. And uh, which is the utmost need at, of the time that we are you know, going through massive destruction in our environment. And um, the reason I love my job is that we really need to see, save the earth. Um, and when I go out in the nature and I feel the nature, it gives me a, such a pleasure that how beautiful it is. And at the same time, I feel a little bit stressed that we are not looking after it the way we should have. Um, so first factor is that I love nature. Second, I love animals. I love interacting with them. I love holding them. I love seeing them running in the forest, in the bushes. Um, and the third factor, which is the topmost factor, is that I love interacting with you guys. So what I love about my job is that when I work with kids and I tell them that, you know, I share my experiences and I share my work with them and they feel, um, I hope they feel inspired in some way or if, um, you know, I somehow help um, in their knowledge and, you know, if they feel motivated that they're going to, uh, in the future, they're going to do something about the environment and for the animal conservation. So this is another thing that you must have seen the pictures that I shared that how I was around the kids all the time. Um, so this is another thing that I love about my job um, to spread awareness in the future generation as well. And it was a lovely question. Thank you. It was a really lovely question. And let's get another lovely question. Let's go to Anian in Chile. Go for it, folks. Have you ever met a Komodo dragon? Of course not. Oh, I am so, you know, you shouldn't have asked this. This makes me feel <laughs> so desperate to go out and start looking for them. One day, one day, I am, um, I'm hoping for that. And I really want to work on Komodo dragon, but it's not out here and it's not in Pakistan. <laughs> so I have to finish my PhD and go out and, you know, uh, work in those areas where I can find them but it's it's really cool and it's beautiful and that's a dream so I've got two dreams I've got a dream of working on crocodiles which I can work in Australia even if I go back to Pakistan I can work over there as well and Komodo dragon awesome well, way back when you showed us that picture of the bearded dragon looking right at us, we got a lot of questions about the bumps around its mouth and about its teeth. So can you tell us a little bit about what sort of the bumpiness is and, and maybe a little bit about lizard teeth, if you know anything about that? So in the first picture, when I was holding it, it was the same lizard, but it had nothing around its neck. But in the second picture, it was all flared around like that's why it's called bearded dragon so um in the second picture uh, i think my volunteer was holding it or my supervisor was holding it actually so it was under stress and it was shouting at us to leave it on the ground which is something like i really feel stressed when i'm holding them and i you know i really need to quickly then get done with the procedures to release them back so it was under stress and when in under stress, they just, um, you know, uh, that's a behavior that they spread out their uh, scales and the scale, spiny scales appear like a bear. But it's normally when you see it, it's not like that. So they have like um, skin, normal skin, uh, and normal scales around their neck. But that whole thing was, you, you saw the mouth open because it was screaming at us and it was under stress. So it was a, like a signal. Um, same as when the lizards change their coloration, the tree dragons, it's the same for uh, uh, baited dragons, that it was a signal for us to leave them back. And some lizards have got, um, you know, sharp teeth and some don't have. Baited dragon doesn't have sharp, sharp teeth. So when I worked on baited dragon, it was fine. Even if we got a bite, it was like, not, it was like a baby bite, you know, 
fine. And I went back to Pakistan and I started working on the three dragons. And I was like, maximum, what could it do? Like, you know, like a normal bite. And you have no idea how tree dragon bites. They are aggressive. They are super aggressive. And I like uh, my supervisor, when he held it for the first time, so my volunteers were all Pakistanis and they were telling my supervisor was Australian. So they were telling him, so you don't, you have to be careful. Pakistani lizards are different. They are not like Australian. And he was like, I have got enough experience in holding the lizards. And when he held it for the first time, he got it, uh, he got a bite on his thumb and it just, the blood just came out like anything. So yes, some lizards have got really sharp teeth and it also, uh, lizards have a adaptation on the kind of, uh, um, um, the kind of feed they have. So some lizards eat insects and some are just, you know, um, food eating or something like that. So it, it adapts with their feeding habit. So cool. What a great lesson about always listening to local knowledge. Um, yes. And also, you mentioned that it was screaming at you. You may not be able to, but could you could you try and make the noise that a bearded dragon makes when it screams at you? Um, I'm not sure, but <laughs> we may just have to Google it and find it on YouTube somewhere. But, but yeah, not about the bearded dragon, but there are um, other lizards, especially gecko. Um, they make some little noises like a. Uh, um, you know, when a, when a cat screams or a baby screams, not like meow or anything, but like a very sharp, um, small uh, sound uh, that it looks like a baby is screaming. And I was holding a gecko and it's, you know, it was like crying like a baby. And I started crying like with it. Like, Don't cry. I'm going to be, because I had to mark it. And at the same time, I felt sorry for the gecko. So I was like, Okay, I'm gonna release you back. Don't scream, but yeah, there are some interesting um, um, voices that you can Google up. Well, I know that all of our students now have their their Wikipedia tangent for the rest of the day. <laughs> I can't wait to Google about what lizard screams sound like. And let's visit Hadley for a question before we end for the day. Okay, what can we do? to help the lizards in our local communities? Um, so, because I've, talking about my experience, I've worked in the farmlands. And for me, the local community about, was about educating the farmers to leave some habitat patches where the lizards could survive. If you would grow crops throughout the area, there would be nothing left for the lizards to survive in. So for me in Pakistan, the croplands having some boundary structures around them was helpful. Um, and, you know, um, wildlife friendly agriculture is a term that a lot of people use now. So agriculture, how it goes with the wildlife, they can still grow their crops, but if they would leave some patches for our animals, that is how we both can collaborate, how scientists and the farmers can collaborate at the same time. So we don't have to, you know, end up in an argument that, you know, the farmers are doing the wrong thing. They have to make money for their livelihood, especially in the developed countries. Um, so the reason, um, the way we could uh, help the community and the animals at the same time is that educate them that, you know, grow your crops, but please leave some habitat patches for our lizards so they can survive. And at the same time, um, same in Australia, um, in Australia, you see some linear strips. The farmlands are, you know, uh, huge, massive. And they leave some linear strips, like patches, uh, for the reptiles to survive in. So over here, I didn't feel that need to educate the local community. Uh, but yes, in Pakistan, it was um, um, really hard to go and talk to the community because the next, next question you would get was like, we have to make money. And I said, no one is stopping you to grow your crops but there's a sustainable way to do that. And they agreed. So we had some workshops with the farmers as well, and they agreed at the end of the day, they realized that yes, we can still help environment, but at the same time, we can make money for ourselves as well. That's I hope nice. that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. And uh, we always end with the same question, Saro. Do you have any advice for the young explorers out there watching today? Um. 
I see a lot of potential in the young explorers and the kids that how they, um, unlike the past generations, how they are interested in different species. So uh, wildlife is not about only the leopards and the lions and everything and the massive animals. They are beautiful animals. But these small cryptic animals and these small um, unattended fauna, I see a lot of potential in the future generations that they want to work on it. They want to explore more about the environment. Um, so I would just, you know, uh, they're already doing really well. I feel they are genius. They are, if I've shared my story. I was, a, you know, uh, really bad at handling the animals and everything. But now I see when I see the uh, kids around me, they are very comfortable with holding the animals. They are not scared of the animals. Um, and they know the importance of, um, you know, ecological importance of animals. So, yeah, uh, keep going. And um, I hope that, uh, and I really believe that future is in safe hands. Totally. And do you have a favorite lizard fact we could end on today? Um, my favorite lizard fact. Uh, well, it's how they change the color um because i've experienced it myself and i've seen it from going from brown color to completely red thoughts it was really beautiful so how under the stress and how under different environment conditions they change their color it's just so lovely and i um i hope these all kids get to see it someday um in their backyards these are changing their colors I hope so too. But students, if you can't find one in your backyard, find one on YouTube. Have, <laughs> have one more thing to Google this afternoon. Uh, to everyone out there watching, thank you so much. We're so happy to be with you today. You can check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you right back here tomorrow. Same time, same place. We're going to be looking at bees and cracking open a beehive to explore what's in there. Um, but for now, it's time to tell Sara goodbye. Let's turn on everybody's microphones nice and loud before we sign off and tell her goodbye and thank you. Ready? Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.